Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Richard Sylvester, who lives in the UK, second guest in a row from, from the UK. Um, and uh, Richard, I would suppose, would define himself as a teacher or speaker on non-duality. We'll let him define him himself um, directly in more detail. Um, he was a student of Tony Parsons um, and many other spiritual influences over the years, but I don't want to speak for Richard because he has his own distinct way of expressing things, and uh, I've listened to him for about four or five hours over the last week, and I've really been looking forward to this conversation. So thanks, Richard, for this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, you know, I gathered from listening to you that you're not real crazy about going into minute details about your own personal story and you know all the various you know spiritual trips that you went on over over the years because um, you you don't seem to feel that those have a tremendously close causal relationship <laughs> you know with your your current state um, but perhaps you could indulge us a little bit by going into <laughs> some of that but we don't have to start with that if you don't want to if you'd rather we could start with just sort of a uh, a statement or expression of you know how you like to you know if you had ten minutes with somebody on a train what what would you like to say to them if they asked you some kind of probing question about you know your your take <laughs> on life <laughs> uh, I usually um, try to avoid talking about non-duality to passing strangers on trains <laughs> unless they <laughs> really seem passionately interested uh -huh. um, let me start maybe with um, trying to express in a very, very brief way what I feel um, the seeing of non-duality means. Um, I, the seeing of non-duality to me, it's very simple. It's simply the seeing through the um, dream of separation. It's mm -hmm. simply seeing that there is no separation and that uh, this of course can be a tremendous shock when it happens but it's the seeing that however many years apparently the uh, person has been alive 30, 40, 50, 60 years it doesn't matter there's been a sense of an independent person there uh, living within living within a world if you like living within an external world um, living a life making choices having autonomy having independence and for me what the seeing of non-duality is about is simply seeing through all of that mm -hmm. simply seeing that all of that is a kind of uh, it's a kind of dream it's kind of hypnosis we might almost say and as I've said, it can be quite a shock when that's seen through and it's realized that this whole sense of being an individual person that's so familiar, so familiar that it's hardly even noticed while it's there, suddenly it can be gone. Mm. And I, I know from listening to audios of you that um, that indeed is what you underwent. And uh, was it a shock for you when it happened? You, it mentioned, was... you mentioned the word shock a couple of times. <laughs> it, it was a shock for me. I think you know, if, if you listen to or read other, other individuals' descriptions, uh, sometimes it's even more of a shock. I've read descriptions or I've come across descriptions where it's been such a shock mm -hmm. that when it's happened, really all the person's been able to do after that is perhaps sit on a bench for two years mm -hmm. looking at the horizon and going, wow. Uh, so it wasn't that um, extreme for me. But yeah, it is pretty shocking to see that this... Um, this person that's so familiar to us is, as it were, I mean, one of the ways I put this is that it's a complete non-necessity. You know, it's suddenly seen that everything, well, I'll put it this way, everything can go on without there being a person there, and indeed it's suddenly seen that actually everything is going on and always has been going on without a person there. Mm. Uh, people who talk about this often use the passive voice. You know, they say it's suddenly seen rather than I suddenly saw. Yeah. Which, you know, because I suppose that's a more pr appropriate terminology because I suddenly saw m makes it sound like there's a person who saw it, and that's exactly what you're trying to, you know, make clear is not is not the case. 
Uh, language is very difficult because, of course, language is determinedly dualistic. Mm-hmm. And my view is, how, you know, no matter um, how much we try to talk in non-dual language, it's completely impossible to do that. So why bother? So it's probably best just to use um, language that feels comfortable. Yeah. And um, occasionally, not very often, I've come across people who write about this who almost torture language in an attempt never, for example, never to use a first-person pronoun. It's a bit silly, really. Um, So, anyway, we'll just try and make conversation and make it as clear as possible. But, of course, what what you've just um, described is, of course, absolutely right, that um, when, uh, if you like, when the person is seen through... There's no one there seeing through it. This is a, a tremendous paradox. So uh, we can't really say that you know that that I, Richard, saw through separation. Nobody has ever seen through separation because when uh, separation is seen through, there's nobody there doing right. that. But I'm sure when you go to a restaurant and the waitress comes up and says, may I take your order, you don't say, well, there is really no me whose order can be taken, and neither is there any you, and, <laughs> and not, in fact, there's no restaurant. You'd, you'd probably get thrown out on your uh, I tried that for about a month. I got banned from every restaurant. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, uh, as I say, I mean, lang- we, have to, we have to make language work, <laughs> um, so it's easier just to, uh, just to uh, say things in a conventional way that people people will understand yeah, yeah. but it, it, I mean let, let's not gloss over the fact that um, in a way what we're talking about here is not just difficult to talk about it is actually impossible to talk about so all the words written about non-duality all the words spoken about non-duality and you know I have to confess I've written and spoken quite a few of these words myself mm-hmm. um, in a sense they're all words around non-duality yeah. none of them can possibly get non-duality itself. And I would say that's true of almost any experience. I mean, how do you describe the color red to a blind man? Yeah, you know, absolutely. What, what can you say? Absolutely, you know? yeah. And I mean, I don't know if we're going to come on to this um, later, but I will just throw this in now. It's also why, um, I, personally, you know, I don't have any time for teachings around this, and I don't have much time for knowledge around this, because um, to me, if you like, this is something which is either tasted or felt or seen, or it's not, and that's all there is to it. And so to um, kind of theorize around it or to theorize about it, it's a bit like um, discussing the chemical uh, constituents of an orange without ever having tasted an orange. Yeah. So it is exactly like that. Yes, it's, this is this is seen or it's not seen, and in a way, in a way, that's an end to it. And yet, you do give seminars and and write books and stuff. And and are you doing that in the hope, perhaps, that those who attend or who read the books are it's it's going to facilitate a seeing for them, or are you just doing it to entertain people? I mean, what what is your motivation if it's if it's really so? random as you make it sound it's certainly not in any hope that anything i say or write might bring about anything uh, absolutely not um in a way I, I, one answer i could give to that question is simply you know if i'm giving a talk then giving a talk is simply what's happening if i'm writing a book then writing a book is simply what's happening uh, there really isn't any agenda here um writing books giving talks can sometimes be fun Mm -hmm. if you want to think of that as an agenda then that's fine but i mean all my professional life i i i was a lecturer i i i I was a professional communicator if you like for many years so it's just kind of natural for this character to write about this and to um speak about it um sometimes for other people where this is seen there's a different character and there's no impulse at all to communicate about it uh, having said that I would say you know it is fun mm-hmm. and um, I think there is something which at some particular point may draw some of us magnetically to this communication mm-hmm. um, there, there was a long period of time, although uh, I spent many, many years on what might be called uh, a variety of spiritual and psychotherapeutic paths. Um, there was uh, a long period of time where I had no, no, no interest in non-duality whatsoever. And then suddenly there came a time 
where non-duality hooked me, if you like. Now, that's a mystery. I can't explain it. It's one of many things which is unknowable. But, um, but that's what happened. So for some of us, uh, non-duality hooks us magnetically. And then, then there's an energy that wants to be around this communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the metaphors about this I most like and uh, quote perhaps too often is this wonderful metaphor of, you know, our, our head being in the tiger's mouth. Mm. If non-duality hooks us, then our head is in the tiger's mouth and then there is nothing to be done other than to wait and see whether the tiger may bite our head off or not. <laughs> um. This is, there's a saying which I heard, which is, I think, attributed to Zen. I don't know if it's from Zen or what, what it's from. But the saying is that, um, you know, if, let's just use the word enlightenment here for the sake of convenience, that enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. <laughs> <laughs> and I've I heard, heard that. And while I was listening to your talks, um, you know, I heard you often say that, I, I heard you often sort of diminish the significance of spiritual practice and, and kind of uh, assert that it probably has no bearing on one's eventual realization or awakening. And, you know, I'd like to sort of in a friendly way beg to differ with you on that and just <laughs> see, see where it gets us, you know, see what sort of discussion it, it stimulates. I mean, you know, do you, would you really say that, you know, it would make no difference uh, in terms of one's eventual awakening whether a person meditated a couple of days, a couple of times a day for several decades, or knocked back a few whiskeys a couple of times a day for a few decades. I mean, wouldn't wouldn't the latter tend to have an influence on the brain and nervous system, which would diminish the the likelihood of uh, realization? I mean, isn't any experience the, our, our our discussion right now, or the taste of food, or the you know realization of non-duality, so, in some way dependent upon the neurophysiology? And aren't certain spiritual practices can you know inf uh, effective, let's say, in fine-tuning the neurophysiology so as to make this realization more more likely? Well, I'd say um, in let's call it the world of duality there is cause and effect. That's obvious. If I knock back a lot of alcohol for many years, I may get cirrhosis of the liver. The problem with what we're talking about here, um, let's give it the word awakening or liberation or seeing through separation. The problem with that is that it is um, outside the world of duality and therefore a causal. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and I think there have been uh, examples, one or two of the, uh, one of them in particular quite well known as somebody um, who knocked back extraordinary amounts of alcohol for a very long time and then mm -hmm. suddenly there was awakening. And, um, yes, if, Sailor, Sailor Bob and Wayne Lickerman both come to mind. Well, there you go. There's two at least. And um, there's been a little bit of research. I'm not going to um, quote this with too much rigor because I don't know a huge amount about it, but there's been a little bit of research into... Um, it's so p difficult to put this into words. Let's say into individuals where separation has been seen through to see if there was any kind of common thread in, in the background, in the life that had apparently been lived by that person up to that point. And um, <laughs> certainly it seems to me the evidence is very, very poor. You know, there just wasn't any evidence that... Um, you know, a high, uh, you know, a, a statistically uh, significant number of these people had been meditating or even standing on mountain peaks in beautiful sunsets. There, um, you know, there, there's just no correlation. I think, I think this is. I, I want to say, I think this is a tremendous challenge to the mind. You know, the mind really does not like what I'm saying, and I, I, my mind doesn't like it any more than anybody else's does, because the mind does live in a world of cause and effect. And the, the mind also lives in a world where there's a kind of natural justice or fairness, where if you put effort 
into something, you get a reward for it. So, for example, if I spend 15 years assiduously learning French, at the end of those 15 years, I can expect to be pretty good at French. So the mind says, well, if I spend 15 years or 30 years learning liberation, then after 30 years there should be liberation. But unfortunately, you can't learn liberation. It doesn't work like that. You know, the mind has absolutely no purchase here. Concepts have no purchase here. Understanding has no purchase here. Um, <laughs> I feel almost uh, almost embarrassed to be saying this because, as I say, um, my logical being and my 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 mind don't like this any more than anybody else's does. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we are. You see, there we are. Somebody who's never even heard the word meditation might be, you know, going up an escalator in a department store, and suddenly there's nobody there suddenly there's just going up an escalator in a department store and in a way that's in a very fundamental way that's all we're talking about here all we're talking about here is seeing that there doesn't need to be a person for there to be a going up an escalator in a department store or for there to be anything else happening yeah no i mean uh i agree it happens and uh, of the 67 or 8 people I've interviewed so far, there have been one or two wh who had no spiritual inclinations whatsoever, and one morning they woke up and things were really starting to cook. Um, but so, but, but that, th th those statistics differ with that research you cited. Uh, I don't know where they, they got their figures. Um, in my own experience, you know, hanging around spiritually inclined people for the last... 40 some odd years, I, I do see a fairly high incidence of people having what we would call a genuine realization or awakening or, or whatever, which, you know, in my own unscientific way seems to be much higher than you're going to find in the general population of people who aren't interested in such things. Okay, can I say one, or if I can remember it, um, two more things? Sure. Yeah. Um, um, about that, one of the one of the things I'd say is that in a very fundamental way, I want to suggest that what we're talking about, although it's a very very natural question and people ask uh -huh. it all the time at talks that I give, I want to suggest that in a way it doesn't matter because what happens happens, and if there is an interest in somebody, if you like, if there is a magnetism towards some kind of spiritual practice or hanging out with non-duality teachers or something like that, if that's there, that will probably happen. It won't definitely happen, because the bus might be late or something, but it will probably happen if there's an inclination to hang out in bars and drink lots of vodka, then that will probably happen. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, you know, this maybe sounds fantastically simplistic, but in a sense, you know, what happens, happens. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a, you know, we have the sense that we are a person who's in control of that, you know, that I can choose to um, sit at the feet of my guru and be devoted for 20 years halfway up the Himalayas, or I can sit in a bar and drink vodka for 20 years. We have a very, very strong sense that we are the causer or the chooser of that happening. And that is just. I'm almost inclined to call it an illusion, which is a word I don't use very often, but let me call it an appearance instead. So in a sense, uh, you know, however strongly we may feel we are choosing to sit at the feet of the guru or to sit in a bar in Boston, actually that is just happening. Okay. And then there may be the seeing of liberation at the feet of the guru or in the bar of Boston, or there may not. And again, you know, that's just happening. And the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, in, in a sense, what we're talking about also belongs to an enormous area called the unknowable. And I think one of the fundamental things that, that happens, you know, if, if, if we're honest, you know, uh, you know when this is seen, if, if separation is seen through, it is a plunge into an enormous let me call it an abyss of not knowing stuff. Now, you know, many years ago when I was younger, um, you know, I knew quite a bit of stuff. And then I set out on spiritual paths and learned to meditate and starting, started studying philosophy and reading Buddhist books and things like that. And then I knew more and more and more and more. And um, 
by the time I first walked up the hill in Hampstead to um, listen to a talk by Tony Parsons, I knew an enormous amount. <laughs> Uh, this is a kind of natural trajectory of a person through life. We accumulate knowledge, as it were. Now, when this is seen through, when separation is seen through, and it's realized there is no person, all of that knowledge gets blown out of the water. Mm -hmm. And there is a plunge into a complete not knowing. And in a way, all of these questions then become irrelevant um, partly because it's seen that there is no real answer to these questions. These are questions that are asked by the mind and no real answer. Um, no real answer exists, let me put it like that. Yeah. And suddenly, when the sense of person collapses, I think also what happens is there's a loss of interest in these questions. Because when the sense of person collapses, there is a very much stronger sense then, if you like, of just living day to day, mm -hmm. living a simple life day to day, with nobody living that life. And when you say that all the knowledge sort of collapses, it, uh, I'm sure you don't mean that if you're a heart surgeon, you're going to forget how to do heart surgery. It's no, just, absolutely it, you not. You know, relative skills, you still, know, still know how to drive a car, or play tennis, or whatever you do. but. Um, you're just saying that the sort of the, the the certainty with which we grip on to concepts and beliefs gets blown apart. Are you not? Absolutely blown you apart, know. and also um, becomes rather irrelevant. Yes, I mean I've said also that you know memory uh, tends to get blown, but um, not in the sense of senile dementia. In other words, um, autobiographical memory, and indeed memory of how to how to carry out heart surgery if that was there remains but the energy of memory um, disappears if you like the energy goes out I mean memories to do with the past obviously and en the energy goes out of the past so it becomes insignificant Perhaps so the person this person can still find their house they don't forget sure. their address but the, uh, the the tendency of the person to dwell on the past and to dwell on memory is just blown out of the water yeah I think maybe another way of saying it might be that the the conditioned the conditioning quality of activity is is diminished to the point where you're not you know you're you're more spontaneous living in the moment you're not sort of impelled by deeply ingrained you know um, habits or impressions that you know uh, is, is that what you're saying um well those wouldn't be my words but okay. uh, we, I'm we just could trying to of, we could I, I mean let me use a metaphor here it's the sort of the metaphor that that, that came to me sort of quite um, quite quite a while ago is that like it, it's like for most people me um the past is um like it's three-dimensional it has a lot of reality to it mm -hmm. and not everybody but the average person tends to spend quite a lot of time in the past yeah and it has a reality to it it's like um you know we can run around in the past it's it really can seem tremendously real and even it seems to me just just one instant of seeing through separation and all of that can collapse and that three-dimensional memory becomes two-dimensional. So the energy disappears out of it, and instead of this kind of very real landscape of the past that might seem very um, attractive to the person, there's just a sort of two-dimensional image which doesn't have very much, um, which, which has very little energy to it. I mean, it's a metaphor. I mean, yeah. when I say it becomes two-dimensional. You don't really mean two-dimensional. Just... I don't really mean two-dimensional. What I yeah. mean is that the kind of the pull to the past, if you like, the attraction of the past, it just, it just disappears. And perhaps everything you've just said about the past could be said as well of the future, you know, because a lot of people spend all their time dwelling in that. Oh, when I get rich. Oh, when I, you know, get married. Oh, when this, when that, you know, and, and totally neglecting what they're actually living now. Absolutely, yes. I was going to come on and say, you know, the say, if you like, another way of expressing this is that time is seen through. You know, it's seen there is no, there is no past or future. You know, the energy goes out of it. There is just what is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm reluctant even to call it now because even now, 
uh, you know, is a word which, um, you know, which makes us think of a time frame, which a time reference, which lasts for a period of time. You know, there is right. literally just this, and yep. the past and the future are seen through. And of course, um, the past tends to be a place of regret and guilt and nostalgia and longing for many people, and the future is a place of fear and hope for many people. And so these also tend to collapse. Mm -hmm. which, so, which doesn't mean you can't make plane reservations, but it just means that you're not sort of vesting your fulfillment in, in something which is completely non-existent, namely... Well, because. you may become more efficient and effective at making plane <laughs> reservations if you're not <laughs> ringing up the aeroplane company with a, a burden of guilt from the past and a burden of hope or fear for the future. That's yeah. absolutely true, yeah. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is that's left, and it's difficult to give a name to what's left, you know, may kind of um, <laughs> may kind of work more efficiently. Who knows? Yeah. It's I mean nothing certain. You know, I mean one of the things I say about um, well, let's call it liberation, whatever you want to, whatever we want to call it. You know, one of the things I say is, you know, there are absolutely no necessary implications. You know, there are tendencies for the life that's lived, if you like, after this event, to change in certain ways, but they are only tendencies. Right. And it's going to be different for different people. And it's going to be different for different characters, absolutely, yeah. 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 You often use, the, and non-duality teachers in general often use the phrase, seen through, and I, I like that phrase, uh, but if, if we take, it a, take that a bit, uh, look into it a bit, generally, the, the more... Oh, opaque something is, the more difficult it is to see through. The more transparent it is, the more easy it is to th see through. I mean, in terms of like a glass or a, or a you know, filter of some kind. And what, what I would suggest, and you know, you'll have fun with this, is that um, certain personalities or certain you know, personality structures are more opaque than others. Uh, you know, a person if a, if a person is a paranoid schizophrenic, for instance, you know, really twisted, uh, having all kinds of psychological problems, the likelihood of their uh, of being able to see through a filter like that seems to me much less than uh, someone who is, you know, psychologically healthy. I mean, of course, these are generalizations. Um, and by the same token, and, and this gets me back to a point I was making earlier, it seems to me, I, I don't have the tendency to dismiss all spiritual practices as unrelated to realization, even though I fully acknowledge that uh, that which is realized is beyond all causality. But it seems to me that the very purpose of, of spiritual practices is to, as it were, make the, the experiencer more transparent, less opaque, so that the probability of, you know, making that leap, so to speak, in, uh, from being a person to a non-person uh, is increased. What do you say to that? Well, we're back into, we're back in the world of cause and effect there, of course. So, um, yeah. <laughs> the first thing I'll say is, you know, per, you know I'm not going, I, you know, I don't buy that. The okay. second thing I'll say is I think that many spiritual practices and psychotherapeutic practices, and more and more spiritual and psychotherapeutic practices kind of borrow from each other as well, can be incredibly useful to a person, absolutely wonderful for um, a person. Uh, I think some of them, by the way, are actually very damaging to a person as well and best avoided, but many of them are great. I spent 30 years meditating and doing many other um, spiritual and psychotherapeutic practices. Um, ab absolutely wonderful. I Nothing to do with liberation, but nevertheless, uh, nothing to do with liberation because liberation is a causal, but nonetheless, absolutely wonderful. Uh, this thing about um, opaqueness, I mean, again, a, a, in terms of um, the paranoid schizophrenic or the psychotic or the psychopath, all I will say to that is, you know, the mind, you know, the mind loves to kind of speculate about this and theorize about it. Of course, it's what the mind does. And all I would say to that is that belongs to the unknowable. Uh, but what you said about, um, if I can kind of take your, uh, you know, your comments off in a 
in, in the direction I'd like to take them in. What you said about opaqueness, uh, it reminded me of a metaphor. I mean, I often use it, but it's a very traditional metaphor. It's a very obvious metaphor, which is that, you know, the person, if you like, sees reality through a veil or through a glass darkly, as, um, as St. Paul put it. Mm -hmm. And um, when, when I'm asked to sum up um, non-duality or, or non-separation as simply as I can. You know, the, the, the simplest thing that I can say is that in, uh, in non-separation, what is seen is this is it. You know, this is absolutely it. And that, in a, in a sense, relates to what we were talking about, about the past and the future. No past, no future, this is it. But the phrase that seems really important to add to that is that in non-separation, it's seen that this is it and this is sufficient. You know, this is enough. There doesn't need to be anything else. I mean, another way of putting this, which I, you know, I, you know, I love, it's not my phrase, but I love it, it's a little bit flowery and ornate, is that, you know, it's then seen that this is already the miracle that we're looking for. You know, the ordinary is absolutely extraordinary, and the ordinary is the miracle that we have always been looking for. And, you know, that's why when if you like, when separation is seen through, you know, all searching stops, you know, searching stops because it, it's realised that there's nothing to search for because this, is, this has always been that which we are searching for. Absolutely. I have no argument with that. It's, it's, it's well, very well said. Um, but the, if I may, the, go ahead. The, sorry, what I, uh, you know, what, I, what I wanted to add um, to that, um, uh, um, simply to that, is that in a way, the, the reason why, if you like, um, for, the, for, the, for the searching person, for the, for the person who feels separated and who is searching, the reason why the everyday and the ordinary is not seen as the stunning miracle that it actually is, um, is uh, because the person acts like a veil. It's like the person is looking at the everyday through the veil of separation, and it makes it kind of muddy because that veil of separation carries all the person's neurosis and all their fears and hopes and anxieties and guilts, all the stuff that we've been mentioning already a little bit. And so it's hardly surprising that if the everyday is experienced through that kind of crust, if you like, mm -hmm. of um, neurosis and separation, that it isn't going to seem very exciting. I mean, another way of putting this, if you like, is that for the, um, for the separated person, you know, what they experience of the if you like, of the everyday, of the ordinary, is not in a way what, um, what, what this actually is, but what they're exper experiencing is their own projections, or a great deal of, their, of it is their own projections. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, you know it's, 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 it's not a, it shouldn't be a surprise, you know, that if you like, that we find life ordinary life dull and look for something else mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be a surprise that if that sense of separation falls away taking with it hopefully um, at least some if not all of that neurosis that then it's kind of like it's stunning and we throw up our hands and we go well this is just amazing uh, yeah. which may which may explain why there are these stories of people who basically just sit around for a couple of years afterwards Mm -hmm. unable really to do very much other than gasp. Yeah, that's what happened to Eckhart Tolle and Byron Katie both. Um, but what I'm suggesting is that that veil of separation, as you just implied, can be very thick. You know, it can be very opaque. And uh, it's, and, and there can be many, many, many layers of condition, <coughs> excuse me, of conditioning, which are going to make it very difficult, if not impossible, for a person to just turn on a dime and say, oh yeah, now I see through it, now, no problem, it's all done, over with. Well, uh, can, I, can, yeah, I, can, can, can I say, I really, you know, I, I really want to say, you know, the, pers the person can't turn on a dime. In a sense, I, what I want to say is the person can't do anything, can't do anything about this. You know, it, the, the person, in a way, is the problem, but the person is in a way also, you know, the person is an, 
when the sense of separation disappears, the person is seen to be, if you like, an unreal construct, and an unreal construct cannot disassemble itself. I mean, I have a strong feeling. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm enjoying this conversation, but I have a very strong feeling that by the end of it, we'll probably still be disagreeing about this point, which is absolutely mm. fine. But you know, this is what I this is what I will sit here and assert that you know that an unreal construct cannot disassemble itself, whether on a dime or whether through thirty years of assiduous self-inquiry. Okay, <laughs> no, we probably still will be having this disagreement, but you know, I I, en I am very much enjoying having it, and it's a friendly disagreement, and uh, and these are you know things that I dwell on a lot because I interview a lot of people, um, some of whom have your pers your way of, of putting things, and these are sincere doubts or questions or ways of thinking that I have, and I'm not just going to sweep them under the rug and pretend I don't have them, you know? So if I can have this conversation with you, who, who knows, by the end of the conversation I may be <laughs> seeing things exactly the way you are, <laughs> uh, because I'm open to the possibility that I'm mistaken, you know, and that and that I'm my very way of sort of dwelling on these perspectives is is keeping me from uh, a greater degree of clarity but um, when one if I could encapsulate what I often what sense when I when I hear non-duality teachers talking is that well and you're gonna I know what you're gonna say to this but that that a description is being used as a prescription and, and I know what you're going to say, which is that you're not prescribing anything because you don't feel like the, the person can deconstruct themselves. So you're not offering a formula or a prescription that anyone can use to, to get out of their dilemma. Um, and I guess my only difference with you there is that I, I would disagree with your previous statement that there's nothing that uh, an illusory person can do to deconstruct themselves. Uh, I, it's sort of like a person standing in a big mud puddle, let's say. And he says, how do I get out of this mud puddle? And someone off at the edge of the mud puddle says, take a step. And he says, well, why take a step? You're asking me to put my foot in the mud again. He says, just take a step, you know, and keep doing that. And eventually you get to the ed of, ed edge of the mud puddle and, and you're out. Uh, so it takes a thorn to remove a thorn. And I realize that from the ultimate perspective, uh, spiritual practices are absurd. They don't make any difference. From the perspective of the sun, it doesn't matter whether the clouds are cleared away or the clouds are there. The sun is always shining. But from the perspective of being on the other side of the clouds, it makes a big difference whether the clouds are cleared away. And again, metaphors break down. This has its limitations, I know. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would suggest that it's not as uh, unrelated as you might think it is that you practice spiritual disciplines for 30 some odd years prior to this realization. I mean, uh, as you say, maybe people who are destined to have this realization are attracted to spiritual disciplines rather than hanging out in bars, and maybe there is no causal connection. Uh, well, I've just uh, wrapped myself up into a corner, but <laughs> go ahead and respond to what I just said, if you would. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I already... <laughs> you have, but, you know, but I so I have I. I have for the last 20 minutes. But I know, and so have I. I'm just, I'm just kind of going at it I, from different angles, you know. All right, let me, let, me see, say, let me see if I can say something now without just repeating uh, simply what I've already said. You can repeat. I, you can re I, think, <laughs> I think stories of becoming, stories of evolution, stories of spiritual evolution or psychological uh, evolution, you know, are incredibly attractive. Mm -hmm. There are many, many, many of them. Uh, many, many of them are completely contradictory. In other words, you could, you know, really take your pick. You know, you can find a, um, a teaching and follow it devotedly for 20 years until you come across exactly the opposite teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, you can find a guru who tells you that you must um, want enlightenment more than life itself. And there are many stories in the traditions about this. You must want enlightenment more than life itself. And that's absolutely fine till you come across a guru who says you have to give up wanting enlightenment entirely. Um, yeah, there are many, many, many stories, and what, uh, as I say, many of them mutually contradictory. Uh, what happens? You know, we want a story, we crave a story. You know, we feel separate, we feel as if we're suffering. We want a solution. Um, we find, if you like, we find a story which is 
um, let's say, which resonates with us or which is attracted to us, and we start pouring our energy into it. And so we then turn this story into something very real. It could be anything. It could be a story, you know, it could be a story about um, working towards liberation. It could be the story of Freudian psychoanalysis. It could be the story of Christianity and um, being saved through the love of Jesus. It really um, doesn't matter. We come across a story and we make it real by projecting, if you like. We project our energy into it and it becomes fantastically real. Uh, then we start hanging out with other people who also buy the same story and it becomes more and more real and eventually our whole life is revolving around it. Um, it's not just a path, it's also become kind of our social life as well, if you like. And, um, you know, some of these stories become um, so popular that we start building buildings around them, temples around them. Uh, again, where it might be a church, it might be a temple to psychoanalysis. And um, if you like, you know, what I'm trying to say is, we, you know, we start, we start with an idea and then we kind of put our energy into it until it becomes more and more real. We start, um, we, by the time we've created buildings, it's almost impossible to see through. It's almost impossible to see that this is actually just a story. It's just mm -hmm. a narrative, if you like, to make sense of the, in other words, it's a narrative to take us away from the reality of unknowing or not knowing into a kind of comforting but but false knowing. Would you say so that I'm for sorry, somebody, so for somebody who's somebody who's spent thirty years um, studying traditional advaita and doing the practices of traditional advaita, you know, it will seem you know, incredibly compelling. The same will be true for the Tibetan Buddhist, the same will be true for the um, Christian, and of course the same will be true for the, um, the Jungian psychotherapist. Each, each of us becomes convinced, if you like, you know, by the story which we have invested, which we have invested um, so much energy in. So, do you feel that you have any energy invested in any stories? I mean, the the, the non-duality world that you live in, so to speak, does it does it play the same game, or is it beyond stories? <laughs> the same games can be played in it, of course, because non-duality is still a story. It's absolutely. I mean, you know, if you like, it's an interpretation. We can't use words about anything without creating a story. I would, however, say that non-duality is the kind of it's the sort of mother of all stories. It's the one that cuts through all the other stories. It cuts through mm -hmm. the psychological and the religious and the spiritual stories. But yes, of course, it is still a story. But I. I think you're the, you open that question with, you know, do I have an investment in in the story? Well, you know, you you were just going on about how people be, do become invested in they invest a lot of energy in their stories. You know, they build yeah. buildings and and so yeah. on and so forth. And I mean, obviously, uh, <laughs> non-duality is a lot less story laden than the Catholic Church. But um, you know, would you acknowledge that within the world of non-duality teachers, there's a certain um, a certain party line or a certain you know certain belief structures really oh absolutely of course absolutely yes and um, maybe one day there will be non-duality churches all over the world <laughs> instead of Catholics I, I sincerely hope not but that is the way of the world yes I mean of course there are um, uh, maybe maybe even in my lifetime there will be the first non-duality war who knows between <laughs> non-duality sects I mean this is kind of what the mind does this is what <laughs> this is what people do. This is what the mind does. You know, there's no reason. <laughs> Notuality, in a way, is no different. But in a in a different way, it, it, it hopefully offers less purchase to these kind of forms of madness and and, and ego madness that tend to accrete around these stories. But as long as there are, um, you know, as long as there's that. As long as there's that sense of separation and that kind of, you know, often really desperate uh, need to find meaning, if you like, to find purpose and meaning and to find an apparent path out of the dilemma of the person, then this is going to happen, of course. Mm -hmm. And people, uh, people defend their corners, and of course. 
Yeah, no, I don't, I, I'm sure that if I were to draw a cartoon of Tony Parsons, you wouldn't put out a contract on my head, you know, because <laughs> you know there's just not that fanaticism. I mean, you're you're more you're not invested in in any particular perspective. Like well, the, I have to say, the internet, of course, is a wonderful. Um... <laughs> it's a wonderful tool for releasing people's rage. <laughs> <Their beliefs. True. laughs> I mean, I don't go onto internet forums and things like that, but I, I have one friend who does, and I mean, the invective and abuse is, is really quite remarkable. But I, I mean, know, even, okay, in, mon even just... in non duality forums. I Absolutely. mean, maybe, maybe that's, that's what you're what referring I mean. to, but that's I've had a couple people, yeah, I've had a couple people say, yeah. you know, all these people who talk this way, they're so full of shit, and, you know, they're really stupid steamed about you know anyone who doesn't toe the the non-duality you know absolute <laughs> fundamentalist line well there are so many different um interpretations i've just had a um an email of, of a program of talks at uh, there's a um, i've called it a spiritual bookshop in london called watkins and i've just had an email with a program of talks and the the first one is a roman catholic priest who's written a book showing with quotations from the bible that jesus was a non-duality teacher hmm. so um hmm. well i probably shan't be going to that talk but <laughs> he may have talk, been there, I, are, I, there are so many <laughs> indeed 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 but there are so yeah. many uh there are, you know, there are so many angles. And meanwhile, you know, meanwhile, what I would say to all of that, in a way, is, okay, well, you know, this may excite us, it may interest us or not, and let's maybe come back to, you know, this is it, and this is enough. Mm -hmm. Well, know, Jesus, you know, he said, in my, life. In, in my Father's house there are many mansions, and to, to me that... To me, that means something which is anathema to non-dualists, which is that there are many levels of consciousness or many levels of perspective, and that ultimately there is only one reality, and there are no levels of consciousness. But insofar as we are alive and living life, then there's the possibility of all these different perspectives and levels of consciousness, you know. But I mean, to 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 quote your to to touch upon your point about mystery, Jesus also said. Um, for the foxes have their holes and the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, which to me means, you know, just sort of dwelling in a state of uncertainty and, and yet finding that to be a state of great liberation. Well, I don't often find myself quoting from the Bible, and I hope you won't think this is a subject change, but I do occasionally quote, except ye become as little children. And it does, except you, I'm, you got it. Uh, except you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom. And I do think there is um, something there that I like very much. I think, in a way, yeah. this seeing through non separation, in a way, is a return to a childlike state. It's a return mm -hmm. to the kind of the, imme the immediacy of what is. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a kind of turning, turning away from. You know the 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 adult complications the that that, that separate us from that immediacy. Yeah, yeah, simplicity and innocence. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, people. I mean, people sometimes ask me, you know, kind of what I do in my day-to-day -day life, which you know, is an in incredibly boring topic. But I mean, I think all I can say to that is I lead a, a quiet and simple life. Yeah. <laughs> I walk round the park and I drink coffee. Well, you sound like you're retired, but um, <laughs> but I know people who I would I think if you were to talk to them, you would you would acknowledge that they have had the sort of realization that you're talking about, who work in factories and you know fly airplanes and you know do all kinds of rather complex things, uh, demanding things, even raise children, you know, um, and there's no incompatibility there. Although I think maybe perhaps a simple life is somewhat more conducive to you know there's less sort of impact overwhelming you from sensory which is probably why you know m the whole monastic traditions arose in the first place people figured well if we can just sort of simplify and have less uh, stuff to deal with maybe we'll settle into a unified state more more readily and i'm probably really slaughtering the sort of terminology you'd prefer to use here well, I think any any judgment that we might um, make uh, about this is um, likely to be wrong. And as I've already said, I'm sure that you know often separation is seen through, but there's never any talking about it, any communicating about it afterwards. Sometimes, you know, 
perhaps because um, that individual doesn't have that kind of uh, character. So, you know, we can never know. Um, if people sometimes ask me, you know, whether I feel that this is an occurrence that is happening more frequently um, at the moment, which is um, a kind of popular view for people to take. And my answer to that is, well, how can we know? How can yeah. we know? Because um, we don't know, you know, we don't know what what, what has been happening. You know, you, the, the, the bus that you took to work last week might have been driven by a bus driver who wasn't there. You can't know. <laughs> you just don't know. Yeah, you don't. And, and people haven't been required to... Uh, tick off a box on their census form about this over the years, so we really don't know. No, people, and, and some people uh, some people don't have the character of a communicator, and um, for other people, they try talking about this, perhaps to their nearest and dearest, and they learn very quickly that that's a mistake. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it can cause great dissension in, in families and so forth, so sometimes... This may happen for an individual, and perhaps they try talking about it just once, and then they don't try again because they realize that that's not going to be welcome. Yeah, I was just corresponding with a good friend who lives in my town here who had, uh, who awoke several years ago. And uh, he, first he was like, oh boy, and he started talking to people, and he very quickly decided not to do that anymore because he was ridiculed and, you know, scoffed at and people told him he was on an ego trip and <laughs> so on and so he yeah. just said he doesn't even want to be interviewed because he just feels like he, he's yeah. going to enjoy this and not draw attention to myself yeah one of the things that um, Tony said about this Tony Parsons is, is that this ruins your life <laughs> and in a, in a very real way that is that I've talked to a lot of people who feel that you know in some very significant ways their their lives have been ruined and in, in, a, in a sense that can even be um, more difficult um, uh, if you have been leading the life of a spiritual seeker and perhaps you know your friends have been if you've been on a path and your friends are all people who are on the same path and you know your social life revolves around that your activity revolves around that and you know you've been going to the whatever you've been going to the group meditations and the group chanting sort of every night of the week and suddenly all of that's gone and it can be devastating it can be absolutely oh, yeah. devastating mm -hmm. and I've certainly come across people who've been asked to leave their spiritual groups uh, because they were no longer able to tow the party line let's say I'm one well there you go <laughs> yeah. yeah and I live in I live in a community where you know I know you used to practice TM many years ago. I live in a community I where, where you know, Marshy University of Management is established and several thousand people meditate. And, you know, I've heard numerous stories where people have an awakening and they're, they're scoffed at by people who have been striving to have just that awakening for decades uh, because they don't look different. They can't levitate. You know, they don't glow in the dark. And, um, you know, so... Or walk through walls. Right. And uh, so they, you know, they pretty quickly learn to just kind of sh keep their mouth shut in many cases. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, I watched a, a interview on Conscious TV or a show where you and Tim Freak and one other fellow were, were talking. And, um, you know, Tim, uh, as you know, has this sort of both and perspective that on the one hand, you, you're not a person. And on the other hand, at the very same time, paradoxically, you are. You know, you have a life, you have kids, you have a job, you, you, you're, and, uh, and yet, very again, back on, on to the other perspective, you don't. You know, and none of that is happening. I wonder if uh, you could juxtapose uh, your way of looking at things with Tim's. If, if, they're not, if there's any juxtaposition, maybe you, got, you just have different ways of saying the same thing. Well, all I can say to that is that, yes, I mean, life, life goes on. An ordinary life, usually an ordinary life, continues to be lived. Mm -hmm. Whether there's... Uh, uh, the only difference, if you like, is that um, let's talk about before and after, although in a sense these are nonsense terms, but, mm -hmm. you know, just for the sake of communication, the only difference we could say perhaps is that before it seemed like there was a person living, like, uh, living that life, uh, and then it's simply seen that that life is lived, but life goes on, and um, life goes on in its 
in its ordinariness, if you like. I mean, you, uh, I, mean, I mean, a Zen saying I quite like, you quoted a saying before, is that first mountains are mountains, then yeah. mountains aren't mountains, and then mountains are mountains again. So mm -hmm. we live an ordinary life as a person, and mountains are mountains. Then there may be this seeing, and everything is absolutely extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. So mountains are no longer mountains, but then, of course the extraordinary becomes what is lived in an everyday sense so it becomes ordinary again so mountains become mountains again so whether a person is living uh, whether it's felt that a person is living life or whether life is simply being lived it still goes on yeah do you feel like though that there is at least some faint remains of a person that that makes life livable um, I mean, if you whack your thumb with a hammer by accident, um, you know that. I swear terribly. Yeah, and and if Should I'm in I the same that? if I'm in the same room with you and you whack your thumb with a hammer, you know the pain is is experienced there in in Richard Sylvester. It's not experienced in Rick Archer, <laughs> although I may commiserate with you a bit. But uh, you know, you're the one who is experiencing the pain. It, it, can, is that possible without any? iota of personhood you know <laughs> well everything simply goes on as before in a way you know there are you know there's a physical body i mean i i, I tend to call this sometimes it sounds a bit unromantic but never mind i sometimes call this a, a psychophysical organism you know so there's a physical organism which can register pain and thank goodness it can also register pleasure mm -hmm. um, there's a character you know there are preferences uh, there are character traits uh, there are likes and dislikes there may be opinions and beliefs even and there's no particular reason why any of that should change um, but aren't, aren't I, all those things together the person <laughs> I mean not, I they're not what I mean I mean they may well be what some uh, philosophers of self um, mean by the person but they're not what I mean by the person what I mean by the person is the sense of separation it's the sense of contraction so the sense that you know I exist here as mm -hmm. a contracted being in an external world which I move around in and have to negotiate with so when I say the sense of person goes what I mean is that that sense of separation if you like that sense of contracted energy expands and that right. sense of separation disappears now what is left maybe everything else it may be there is a tendency I've noticed I've noticed in both myself and in other people that I've talked to there is a, a tendency that when that energy of contraction um, goes into expansion there's a tendency for at least some and maybe quite a lot of neurosis to disappear so, if you like, the character that's left may be, hopefully, less neurotic than the person was before. But apart from that, you know, characteristics, likes, dislikes, preferences, um, all of that simply goes on. Why not? You know, if the person, if, if, if you know, if the person enjoyed country walks before, why should that which is left afterwards not enjoy country walks probably they'll enjoy country walks more because they won't be carrying a lot of neuro neurotic baggage on the country walk mm -hmm. so would it be fair to say in attempting to describe can I say one can I say one more thing because I was um, sure I was reading a little thing on the um, web uh, two or three days ago about the Jivan Mukti, which is not something I know very much about, but it did bring a uh, it did bring a thought to my mind, which I think has some relevance. I think you know, we we set up these stories of becoming, you know, stories, if you like, about how I will eventually um, escape from whatever my misery is as a person, because usually it's not recognised that the core misery is the misery of separation so we set up these stories and one of the ways we do this it, it must be so obvious both in in religions in spiritual paths also in psych in psychological and psychotherapeutic paths as well is that we create an ideal of a being which we might one day become 
whether it's you know a Buddha, a Jivan Mukti, um, uh, somebody who has undergone their final psychoanalysis. Um, it, it, it really it doesn't really matter. But I mean, it's, it's like this is one of the, if you like, one of the constant habits you know of our minds that we will uh, we will project outside of ourselves an idealized version, an impossibly idealized version of what it can be like to be to be a human being let's say and um, in a way this is great because now we've given ourselves meaning and purpose and hope for life because now my life can be about reaching that ideal and because it's an impossible ideal it can last me all my life there's no danger that it will ever be achieved and then I'll suddenly be confronted with hopelessness again so I think we have to be, you know, we have to be, we have to be very, we have to be wa very wary of these stories. You know, these stories are, if you like, you know, they're created out of our own um, dis-ease or unease with ourselves as um, as a means of 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 giving ourselves hope and giving ourselves a path. Um, in a way, the main purpose of which is that it should never be achieved. Yeah, no, as soon as it's achieved, it's failed in its purpose. Yeah, there's a, a spiritual teacher named Francis Lucille, whom you probably know, and uh, someone quoted him recently as saying that the problem with the progressive path is that people never feel they, they can reach the goal of it. They never feel they're good enough for you know whatever the goal may be. But he also said in the same breath, the, the problem with the direct path is that people often consider themselves enlightened when they're not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I feel like I, I want to put in two things there. Firstly, and the problem with this conversation is I, uh, I, I reject all talk of paths completely. And the other thing is I also reject talk of enlightenment. It's not a word that I've, um, that I've ever used. I think it has far too much baggage. It has a lot of baggage, it. absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. What we were yeah. saying a minute ago about the Jeevan Mukta, um, you know, whoever coined that term, in all fairness to him or her, uh, you know, may not have really meant by it what many people have imbued it with. You know, it's simply a term which means liberation, which sure. is essentially sure, sure. what you, what uh, you were just talking about. You know, liberation as opposed to constriction. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, but you know, people sort of glorify a lot of these terms and make them impossibly inaccessible, as you were just saying. Uh, and you know. If, say well okay if you're really a Jeevan Mukti you should be able to hover three feet off the ground and you know you should be able to do all this stuff they uh, they attach all sorts of baggage to it and and as you say make it unreachable um, yeah, but whereas, it, but, but whereas it really it's just a very simple simple natural condition which many have reached if you want to use the word reached but we love to set up these ideals. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the area of spiritual, religious, or psychological life. It can be in other areas as well. But we love to set up these ideals. Oh, yeah. I mean, look at all the hoopla that went into President Obama before he became sure. president. People expected him to just sort of change sure. the world overnight or something, you know. <laughs> and then everybody's disappointed because he couldn't do it. Uh, so now, what was I going to ask you now? Ah, here it is. Um, do you have anything to add before I fire another question at you? No, my, <laughs> no, my mind's just gone blank. You fire good, away. Good, okay. <laughs> That's a good condition to be in. Um, you know, you were saying earlier about appreciation of mystery, and, and I agree with that. In fact, I'll send you a song by Iris DeMent called Let the Mystery Be, which I, I sent to Tim Freak the other day, and he loved it. Um, and, you know, if you're really true to that orientation, you know, then it it really is difficult to to f to sort of form a conviction about anything. And I, I and I you know I confess that I am not true to it to that extent because I do have convictions about things, or at least not if not convictions, then just sort of beliefs or perspectives that I favor because they make sense to me. You know, in light of everything I've thought about and everything I've experienced, they they somehow resonate. And but I'm certainly open to the possibility that they might be turned on their head. You know next week and and I will not you know I'll say oh how silly I was to think that way um, but you know in our in the course of our discussion so far you know I don't mean to sound accusatory but uh, you know you you definitely have <laughs> certain point you know <laughs> emphasize certain things like it you know definitely it's this way or it's that way or right? spiritual practices are totally unrelated to realization which to me <laughs> do, do, doesn't sound like a complete embrace of, of the mystery <laughs> of life it seems more like okay well this is 
the way it looks to me, and therefore it's the way it must be. Can I add one more thing, though? I would also say that none of that has any importance whatsoever. I really do think it's important to... It's important to add that, paradoxically, it's important to add that none of that has any importance whatsoever. Yeah, well, I love the word paradox. And so in light of... The, in, in keeping with in the spirit of that word, I would agree with you and yet disagree with you, paradoxically, uh, because if you... You know, if you say to a room of peop room full of people that, uh, you know, well, from where I sit, spiritual practice is totally irrelevant, then it's going to tend to have the effect of uh, diminishing their like their their motivation to do it, which might seem fine to you, but it's it's to me it's like a guy standing on a mountaintop saying, okay, here's the view from the mountaintop. It's really great. By the way, you can stop climbing because the view from the mountaintop is like this. But people halfway down the mountain, that's not a relevant instruction for them. You know, it may be when they reach the summit, if they're deeply in the habit of climbing, you might say, hey, cool it. You don't need to climb anymore. You're, you, this is it. This is the summit. Th this is as good as it gets. But for someone who's still climbing, is, and again, a metaphor is a metaphor, and it has its limitations, that it's not helpful to shout down a description of your immediate surroundings unless it's perhaps inspiring. It's more. Well, I, I, I want to. Uh, sorry, I want to sort of say two things at, at, at this point. One is, you know, I don't. You know, I think that uh, it's something about kind of. You know, I wouldn't confer that kind of power on anything I say to have any influence on anybody it else. It does. Though, are, no, people listen are, to you and Tony Parsons and all these people, and, and in many cases, they try to sort of put on the clothing of non-duality without actually having had the realization, you know, and and it can definitely influence their behavior, their orientation, it, you, know, you know what I mean? Have you seen that, or, or does that not make sense from... Uh, it, it doesn't make that much sense to me, and um, again, uh, in a way, I, mean, I feel like from where you're coming from, that's kind of meaningful and important, yeah. and you said something, I, I wanted to sort of pick up on a few phrases back, and I've forgotten exactly what it was, but it was something about... Something about the, the mountain Something metaphor. about being helpful, no, 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 something about being helpful, and I mean, you know, there, there is no intention here to be helpful. Okay. There is no intention here to be helpful. Would um, you care to elaborate to, on that? Uh, well, there isn't really anything <laughs> to elaborate. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of fairly suspicious of people who want to be helpful. I mean, you're uh, helpful in, in other... In in if you were walking down the street and a little kid fell off his well, bicycle, that's, that's, you, that's you would sort of help him. Well, and, there'd you know. be, there, there may be an impulse there, and I might pick him up and dust him down indeed. But that's not what I'm, uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. You see, I mean, we talked previously about agendas. And, you know, if I'm trying to be helpful, then that's an agenda. Mm -hmm. And um, there isn't that agenda here. You I'll know, tell you I a little story, very brief story. You know the, the, that uh, the Ama, the hugging saint who goes yeah, around yeah, yeah. hugging millions of people? Uh, she, was, she does all these huge humanitarian projects, especially in India, you know, uh, building homes for the tsunami victims and helping prostitutes and lepers and widows and all this stuff, hospitals. And one of her senior swamis said to her one time, Amma, what more can we do to help the world? And she said, what world? <laughs> <laughs> to me, that story implies that, you know, she very well knows that ultimately there, it, the whole thing is just, there is no world, it's an illusion. There is, there's no one who can help anyone. We're all the same person, as it were. Uh, but on the other hand, paradoxically, she has this mighty drive to help people, and I, I think the two can coexist. Of I course, they, of course, they can coexist. You know, and the, you know, the, uh, there is the character. You know, there, whatever character is there is there, and whatever happens is hap uh, you know happens. I'm just saying, you made some reference to talking to people about uh -huh. non-duality and saying this and that, and. I just wanted to um, to make it clear that there isn't an agenda to help people. Okay. Uh, when that's going on here. Um, so are you just saying that the it's richer... Something, it's, something that cut, that it's something that either happens or it doesn't happen. At the moment, it does happen occasionally. And if you wanted, you know, if you ask me, um, you know, why I do it, well, I could kind of give the <laughs> non-duality answer and say, you know, I'm not doing it and so forth. But if you wanted to push me and say, well, you know, why are you doing it? You know, the only answer I could come up with, well, it's kind of fun. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of 
you know, if it's there, it's there, and it's kind of fun. And if that wasn't happening, something else would be happening, and that might be kind of fun too. I don't know. Okay. So you're just saying that there the, the Richard about... character is wired such that there's not this, you know, drive to help. But somebody else with a non-dual realization might have oh, different different wiring. Is that what I, you're saying? I would say that when it comes to what we're talking about here, I'm not talking about, you know, picking somebody up and dusting them down after they've fallen off their bike. But in terms of what we're talking about here, about non-duality, what's seen here is, you know, there is no help. There is no one to be helped. There is no one to help. There's no possibility of help. Help doesn't even come into it. But if in the meantime, you know, um, life configures itself, if you like, as a group of people sitting in a room in London and, you know, Richard sitting there giving a talk on non-duality, that's kind of fun. You know, I enjoy doing that. And if that wasn't happening, something else would be happening. Maybe I might be walking around my uh, local park. And there's no difference in the signal. I really want, you know, from where I'm coming from, you know, I really want to stress this. There is no difference in the significance of those two possibilities or many other possibilities that could arise. Richard sitting in a room talking about non-duality, Richard walking around a park and drinking a cup of coffee at his favorite cafe. There's no difference in significance because neither of them have any significance. Is there a difference in living life as it is now lived uh, and the way it was lived 20 years ago? Yes, absolutely. How, what's that difference? Well, there's a great deal less neuroticism now. And is that and, 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 and as life was lived 20 years ago, there was a constant searching because as life was lived uh, 20 years ago, there was a constant sense of separation. Now, that wasn't recognized as such. It was recognized as all sorts of other um, unhappinesses with life, if you like. Uh, but 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 life was if you so so if you like you know twenty years ago this was never enough. You see what I'm saying is this is it and this is enough. When this is seen without the person looking at it, it's seen to be enough. There doesn't have to be the saving of the planet. You know there no. doesn't have to be the guiding other the, the guiding other non-existent people to enlightenment. When <laughs> this is seen as it is, this is enough. So 20 years ago, this was never seen to be enough because right. that's what it's like to be a separated person. And yeah. you know th this this separated person carried quite a lot of neuroticism 20 years ago. And you certainly wouldn't trade if you know go back to that. You know, this is you know. Life is is. Pr this I, is a <laughs> this is a dangerous question because this is a question that kind of starts dangling. I'm not saying you could trade or anything. <laughs> I'm I'm just sort of hypothetically saying you know that life as is now being lived there in Turnbridge or whatever it's called for for this Richard character is is preferable. It's it's more fun. It's it's. This is this is this is the question I usually try to avoid answering in meetings, and somebody eventually nails my head to the wall and forces the answer. Well, what I'm getting at in a, in a sneaky lawyeristic sort of way is that you know. Just you know, your life has been enhanced. If and and, and no, terminology. My life hasn't been I know, I know. Terminology I, I, is is hopelessly I, inadequate. No, no, no. I know. I, I I don't mean to be pedantic, but I think in this case it's not just about terminology. So I'm going to give myself the luxury okay. of saying this. You know, my life has not been enhanced. I don't have a life. You don't have a life. Nobody has a life. But as somebody. A, a, a finally nailed me down with this question in a meeting you know, um, <laughs> you know would you prefer I mean, um, you know which is preferred yes this is preferred I have to yeah. put my hand up and say this is preferred because but, but there's also you know there's a huge loss you know I'm not the first person to say you know that, that, that well let's call it liberation if we must you know liberation is not about gaining anything it's about l losing something and it may be about not just losing something but losing a great deal in a way your whole life so there yeah. is a huge loss as right. well a loss of all the stories a loss of all the purpose a loss of all the wonderfully meaningful things that um, 
you know, that, 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 that this individual used to do, you know, so meaningful, meditating and following the guru and, and all the wonderful psychotherapeutic work, all of which was good, by the way, you know, none of which is regretted. Mm -hmm. um, but all of that sense of, of living life meaningfully, you know, it's, all, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's gone. And uh, what is left? if you like is walking around the park and having a cup of coffee yeah and maybe in a way you know having a cup of coffee for the you know the first time ever I looking at mean. a tree for the first time ever mm -hmm. you know rather than looking at the person's own projections superimposed upon the tree yeah and that's what happens in life. I mean, we, you know, we grow into adolescence and we lose all our little toys that fascinated us so much as children, you know, and we grow into adulthood and, and the things that we really get a kick out of in adolescence may seem trivial, you know, and obviously I'm talking about chronological age there, but, um, you know, at every, if there's a new stage in life, naturally things that belong to the old stage that were integral to it, are not going to be there anymore. Well, this is all true, and um, you know, absolutely, it's like uh, um, you know, we, you know, we uh, we grow up, and we, you know, we no want to, no longer want to play with a jack in the box. We want an electric train set, and nobody's brought us an electric train set, and that's jolly awful. But what we're talking about here isn't quite that, because what we're talking about here is the end of a life. Yeah. In a way. Mm-hmm. But as you say, it's not going on to a new stage. It's the end of a life. It's the end of a life. Mm. But it's uh, in your, from your perspective at least, it's better than being neurotic. You know, <laughs> <laughs> seeing seeing well, a look, tree. Who is, a, who is who who is going to sit here and say that being neurotic is better than being less neurotic? Come right. On. <laughs> and when you give us when you give a talk or a retreat or whatever you call them, and there's an audience full of people, I have a feeling that most of the people in that audience are sort of feeling, yeah, I kind of want what this guy has. I mean, I I I, I, I just as soon get rid of my neuroses. It's, and, it can't be helped. It's the nature. I mean, you know, and and. And, and, and I used to go up the hill to Hampstead to listen to Tony and, mm -hmm. and think that it's inevitable. It's like, in a way, you, you know, as long as there is that sense of separation, there is always going to be a searching and there is always going to be a longing. And, and this, the, the searching can take infinite number of ways. And what is longed for can appear to be infinite number of things, ranging from enlightenment to a sports car to who knows what. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and in a sense, that's all inevitable. That is a part of what it means to be a person you know to live with that sense of separation yeah somebody would some some would say that that's fundamentally the same drive you know that there's this sort of a natural tendency to seek greater happiness you probably heard that back in your old tm days if you recall that phrase and and that whether that takes the form of the sports car or of liberation it's the same fundamental drive and well i, I used to teach maslow's hierarchy of needs oh, and we're very go. much in that area and at the time that i taught it i thought it made a lot of sense well you know in a way for a person it does make a lot of sense you know there's nothing wrong with it yeah okay well uh you know, I, I can be very persnickety, as you can tell. I mean, I should just <laughs> hammer away at certain things over and over again. But I, I feel like I've mind-melded with you to a great extent you know, <laughs> more than I had at the beginning of the talk. I can, I can see where you're coming from. Um, I, I do sort of feel like even though you've, you know, it's, it's sort of like you don't feel a personal necessity or drive to, you know, change anybody or make them happy or improve anything there's you you're kind of an you you know someone who has realized that vastness that impersonal sort of nature of things inevitably becomes a kind of a force of nature to to facilitate that sort of clarity in others you know maybe they don't maybe they hide their light under a bushel and don't say a word and like we were talking about earlier but in the case of someone like yourself who writes books and gives seminars I would argue that you are having an effect, whether you want to or not, whether you whether you think you are or not, uh, you know, whether you feel like you're motivated to or not. 
you, you do go out and give the seminars and write the books, that takes a certain amount of motivation, and people come to them, and there must be some sort of chemistry that goes on there that is actually helpful for people. Well, it, it, in some ways, it's lovely, and I think, you know, it, we could ask ourselves the question, why does anybody go to a talk on um, non-duality? And I think, you know, the answer to that, it, it, it's a little bit like, go, it, it's a, a little bit to do with going back to that wonderful quote, you know, our head being in the tiger's mouth. You know, if there, there may there may come a time for certain people where there is simply a resonance with this communication. There's just a recognition that this is, you know, you may very well disagree with this, but I'm going to say that there is a, a resonance with this communication and, and a recognition that this is the final coming home. You know, this is the ultimate. I this completely, is the, I this completely is the, agree. As I said I, earlier, this is yeah. the story. It's still a story, but it's the story that cuts through all the other stories. Yeah, And no. there is just... It's a mystery. It's part of of the unknowable, but there may simply come a time where there is a magnetic resonance with this um, communication. In which case, that's where the person will be, unless the bus breaks down on the way. <laughs> I can, I don't disagree in the least. I think that you really nailed it by saying that, and. Uh... I think resonance has a lot more to do with it than the words that are spoken, too. I mean, if if you sit with a person or with a group and, and just go on for a weekend, there's a lot more that is conveyed in the silence than in the words, you know, in a situation like that. Um, you know, people don't go home with a whole lot of new concepts that really help them out. You know, that really, rather they they attune to some extent, resonantially, <laughs> if that's a word, and, you know, Maybe some of them actually have that shift. And, I mean, as you said in your own Maybe. history, in your own history, your your shift was sort of intermittent for a while at, at first until it kind of stabilized. And and um, sometimes I think it takes multiple exposures or multiple tastes before the, the the whole thing kind of steadies. In some cases, that seems to be the case. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, didn't you I'm say that? To, I'm, go I'm going to ignore the kind of, you know, the cause and effect there of the multiple exposures that then yeah. create that. But, you, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, uh, I, was, um, I, w I was asked to read a, a book recently by um, a, a new writer on uh, non duality, an Australian um, chap, and he's got. It's, it's, Delight is something very delightful in there. I can't remember. I wish I could remember the exact phrasing, but he's uh, he, he's, uh -huh. he's kind of addressing this thing of giving advice about this, and he says, "Well, you know, do what you like." He says, "You know, I mean, have a cup of tea, go to meetings. Uh -huh. um, if 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 you like, find you know, find someone who's awakened and hang out with them. Do what you like. It won't make any difference." <laughs> So saying he continues to conduct meetings and write books. You know, that's the that's what seems ironic to me is all these people saying don't don't bother. It doesn't make any difference. But sign up well, for my next course. Well, <laughs> <laughs> if um, it, it, you know, if giving an, if if giving them a, a meeting in let's say London, you know, next month seems like fun, then that may be what happens. And if people uh -huh. come to it, it'll happen. And if it doesn't happen it doesn't matter who is that guy in australia by the way um he writes under the name rick tam barry i believe and uh, oh, okay his book it's it's just come out recently in england it's called the telling stones okay just curious because my next interview was with a guy in australia but it's a different guy right <laughs> all righty well i feel like you know my nature is such that i could carry on for another hour doing this and annoying the heck out of you could um, your audience Oh, who is my audience? Uh, no, I said, could your audience? Oh, good question. Uh, yeah, they might say, all right, Archer, enough is enough. You know? <laughs> Let's leave this guy alone. <laughs> but um, I, I personally, I've really enjoyed this, and I hope you don't feel I've been um, disrespectful or no, anything. I, uh, no, I enjoy the cut and thrust. I, um, I did an interview recently, a written interview, with um, um, a, 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 a website called Advita.org, which is a very mm -hmm. traditional website of the Whole, <laughs> the whole interview was, um, you know, it was good. It was pretty tetchy. I think at one point the interviewer actually said, "Oh, come off it, Richard." <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. No, no, I, no, I enjoy it. You know, I do think. But I think one of the things, I think perhaps a slight problem. I, I mean, the kind of, um, the kind of part, uh, line you've been pursuing fairly doggedly throughout this interview, I think, is you know, it's a very natural one, and it's uh-huh. uh, very understandable why a lot of these interviews go down these paths. But you know, there's another part of it. Things, you know, other things get lost. Um, can get lost within that. Yeah. And, um, I wouldn't want them to get lost. You know, I do. You know, I do think. I mean, one of the things. Um, I don't know whether I'm quoting or misquoting. I'm never quite sure. But um, one of the things I kind of remember reading in Nisargadatta, and I might be misremembering it, is um, it, it is don't you see? This is already the miracle. You know, this is already the miracle for which you're searching. And I think uh, that is something I would like to stress much more than you know these kind of um, dissensions or disagreements about whether there's a you know, path or no path and things like yeah, that. Yeah, you know. and you know, in a sense, I mean, in in terms of the essence of what you've been saying, I have no disagreement whatsoever. I think you're totally on the money, and um, you know, but taking your Nisar- Nisargadatta quote as an example, you know, he would say something like that. Then he would turn around and and have a nice rousing bhajan session, you know, with with the folks who happen to be Which there. Is you know. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, you something, know, I, you know. I um, you know, I spent a significant part of my life um meditating in groups and doing wonderful chantings and so forth. Loved it. Lovely. Mm-hmm. Loved it. Chanting's great. Yeah, if it, you know, whatever floats your boat, as they say. Well, exactly. Chanting's great if you find it great. It's very enjoyable if you find it enjoyable. Uh-huh. And if not, maybe it's hanging out in a bar. Yeah. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. <laughs> and there's no reason, of course, why you shouldn't do both. Yeah, some people do. Uh, okay, is there any fine? Uh, did did anything kind of get lost in the shuffle? You said a second ago maybe something can get lost when we're having this sort of debate type of of conversation. Is there anything you haven't I had a chance probably. to express that I? <laughs> Probably masses of stuff, but it's uh, you know my it's not going to come to me. <laughs> yeah, and you know I, maybe I should close in saying that I I fully acknowledge that you know who knows a year from now I might be singing exactly the same song you're singing you know and and might have completely dropped this whole perspective that I've been you know, hammering away at here. Uh, you know I'm open to that possibility. I I don't consider my degree of clarity to have you know reached the pinnacle of possibilities here uh, I'm just sort of going as honestly as I can by th- you know seeing things the way I see them uh, but trying not to be dogmatic about it you know trying to sort of be inquisitive open-minded and, and <clears throat> recognizing that um, you know I might totally change my perspective when the opportunity presents itself you think <laughs> my wife my wife just came into the room and she says you take yourself too seriously. At least, at least I, th- I think so, thinks so. She said I have headside headphones on. <laughs> what 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 does the dog say about this all? The the dog is just uh, wants to go for a walk. Yes, you see, I think that's the secret. You know, I mean, people talk about. <laughs> I don't want to labour this, but people, people. Uh, I I can't remember if it was in TM. You know, they had this concept. I think it was uh, the different levels of consciousness, and one of them was God consciousness. Yes, it was. But I think what we're talking about here is dog consciousness. Because, right. You know, dogs are just, <laughs> just. You know, this is it for dogs, and they're always up for whatever this is, and they just. Get on with this. <laughs> Reminds me of uh, the one about what does the uh, the agnostic, insomniac, um, dyslexic do? He stays up all night wondering if there's a dog. <laughs> 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 all right, Richard. So uh, on that profound note, what we can perhaps draw this to a close. I, I really right. appreciate uh, the opportunity to have spoken to you. Um, I, I find it very stimulating and enlivening, and um, I, I hope others will en- enjoy this conversation as well. Um, uh, as I always say at the end of these interviews, um, if you are listening to this in some way that you're not aware of the fact that there is a site called BatGap.com, which is an acronym for Buddha at the Gas Pump, uh, go there and you'll find all the interviews that have been conducted. You can sign up for an email to be notified uh, when new ones are conducted. 
Um, there are discussions that take place uh, in each um, interview's little subsection. So some discussions around this interview may may you know occur. Um, and uh, there's a podcast you can sign up for if you like to listen to things on your iPod, as as I do. Um, and uh, my next interview, as planned, is with a fellow named Vishrant, who lives in uh, Perth, Australia, Western Australia. He's in France right now, but he'll be back in time for the interview, which I'll conduct on Thursday. So thank you very much for watching or listening, and we'll see you next week.